Welcome to another episode of Homebrews in Focus, an episodic video series covering homebrews with their developers. Joining me today is Kevin Hanley with Kahan Games, and we're going to be discussing Larry Long Look for a Luscious Lover. Welcome, uh, Kevin. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, I was just, sorry, I was just getting a drink and thinking about how cool it is that my whole point of like making this game back in the day was one, to like teach me programming, but two, to expose new people to this game and to think that like you might have been one of those people and now we're talking about it all these years later it's anyway go ahead i just wanted to talk about how cool it was for a second yeah no that's great that's actually <laughs> uh very relevant um larry wasn't the first game i played of yours but it was a uh, soon uh on the top of the list of the ones i played Sweet. um entering later into the scene um my first, my first game I played of yours was The Incident, but uh, I went back to Larry when I could track down a copy. Yeah. Um, trading it, for, it, it from a, a Bo's uh, stash of duplicates. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy how that game wouldn't stay in stock. Yeah. Um, I think it was the first game that I released where we had to actually order a second batch, and then those sold out. It was just so hard to come by. Didn't expect it. <laughs> Um, to give the viewers, if they haven't played the game, um, so this is basically the 8-bit adaptation of 40-year-old version of the movie. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it stars, you're the protagonist, um, a, depending on the version of the game, 38 to 40-year-old, um, virgin looking for love. And the game was originally made by Sierra in 1987 for the DOS, uh, MS-DOS, Apple II, other 8-bit computers, and then you ported it to the NES in 2014. So before we kind of jump into the game, could you give a bit of a background about um, yourself, Kahan Games, uh, in, in the homebrew scene in general? Sure. Um, so my name's Kevin, and I started... Uh, I was a member of Nintendo H from around... 2007, um, and Nintendo Edge, for those who don't know, used to be a Nintendo collecting forum, which no longer exists. Um, but a lot of the collectors and, and gamers started coalescing there, and uh, they created a brewery forum specifically for people who uh, wanted to learn to program. So um, Brian from Retro USB started doing some tutorials called Nerdy Nights, uh, and I j- jumped on pretty early and, and tried to. Uh, learn it just because I was going through a, a bit of a struggle trying to find a job and trying to keep my mind focused and occupied. I thought teaching myself programming, um, which I had never had any background doing, um, other than maybe some old MS DOS batch files. Um, I don't know, it was sort of a challenge, um, and I just stuck with it. So, uh, released my first game, Frogger, uh, back in 2009, and sort of been making games ever since. Um, but, but from the start, uh, Larry was the most important game that I wanted to port. Um, just have a lot of history with the ga- with the original DOS game. Um, used to sneak in in the in the computer room at home and then play it behind my parents' back. And it turns out they knew I was playing it, so um, I was not sneaky at all. But um, just a lot of good memories um, of playing it, and my brain sort of always sticks to that early uh, PC NES era. So. Um, just wanting to bring my favorite games from the past to my favorite system, which is the NES, was was and has been uh, my main purpose, I think, as a home brewer. I see. Yeah. Um, was Larry um, your first dive into adventure games or point and click or? No. Um, so I had a I had a friend who lived nearby uh, named Keith. And he had an old early computer too, and he actually had King's Quest. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that was probably my first uh, step into adventure games. Um, so that's just that uh, that predates Larry by a few years, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was very very early on. Um, I think Monkey Island I was exposed to around that same time, also. Um, but yeah, just one of one of the earliest for sure. Um, if I recall correctly. You kind of touched upon a little bit that Larry was really important to you. I think you wanted that to be your first game to be on the NES. 
but you had to step back and kind of take on different projects, kind of learn the process before you jumped in. Is yeah, that right? Pr pretty close. Um, so to teach myself programming, I started with Frogger just because that was um, one of my, I was going through sort of a, an obsession because I had watched the King of Kong and the whole Donkey Kong world record thing. So I, I knew yeah. I was good at Frogger, so I started chasing that record. Um, so around that same time was when I started learning to program, and that was sort of the, I knew Frogger so well that I, I felt confident that I could sort of recreate it on the NES. Um, mm -hmm. But immediately after that is when I wanted to do Larry, um, but figured out really quickly that different screens require different name uh, game states and sort of I, I i had never structured a game that big with different chr files and things like that so i had to sort of take a step back like you said i did sneak and peek to teach myself uh eight by 16 sprites um and just from there i would do another project and another project to learn another skill but i would always try to return to larry so uh, larry started i think in 2010 but took like you said, years uh, for yeah. it to actually come out in the end. All right. Um, if you're all right, I think we'll show there is a trailer that you made or a promo before the release. So I think um, let's pull it up, um, show it off, and then we'll talk a little bit more, and then we'll jump into the gameplay. Great. All right. So let's take a look at um, this trailer, and let's start it off. Coming soon, baby. I remember being so proud of that, sitting on the toilet, reading the paper joke in the middle of the trailer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't remember a whole lot, but I remember putting that together and being very proud of that moment. Um, but it's cool. It shows a lot of the, I think, the highlights of uh, yeah. <laughs> events in the game. Um, for... Promos or trailers a common thing for homebrews at the time, or what made you put that together? You know, now that you mention it, I don't know that they were. Um, I don't know. I, I think I was trying to... It was such a special game to me that I wanted to sort of... I knew, I knew people were waiting for it, mm -hmm. um, but just trying to sort of build on the hype, um, I thought it would be good to put a trailer together. It, it probably did a lot to spread the word. And before I pull up the actual gameplay, to kind of preface the importance of this, and I guess in maybe in your development career and for homebrews in general, your port of Larry ended up being a major catalyst for awareness of you about NES homebrew. Did you expect that kind of reception? When you started the project, when it was released, it ended up going to be picked up by, I think, um, uh, Washington Post or IGN at the time, and the word really got spread. So, you know, what were your, your thoughts right before you got released and then how it ended up happening? Well, I mean, when I, when I set out to make the game, I certainly didn't think far enough ahead to, to think that it would be picked up by anything or anyone, honestly. I just mm -hmm. wanted to see if I could finish the game. Um, but I knew among the forum, at least, it seemed to be people were wanting it. Um, and it had been in development, like I said, for a long time. So people had been waiting. Um, but no, I, I, I think IGN did have a lot to do with um, sort of 
getting the word out. Um, and, and it's the one game that I've made to this day where people are emailing me out of the blue, you know, almost every other week. Um, someone's looking for a copy. Like somehow people are keep, you know, they're continuing to find out about it. So no, I had no idea that it would get to this level. Um, and seeing people still sort of hold it, you know, homebrews in general have come a pretty f far distance since then. So to see people still consider it a good game, um, I think uh, it means a lot to me and, and shows the power of the game in general. It's, it's a very well-designed game. It's uh, great to hear. Um, so if you don't mind, we'll jump into the gameplay. We'll keep talking. And then um, at the end, we'll kind of reflect upon it, and then we can do some more um, Q&A back and forth. OK. So we're playing the 2020 version. Yes. <laughs> uh, so this has a couple bit of um, changes from the original. Um, there's a factory scene in the beginning right here, uh, which repeats if you end up dying. And then uh, you had a couple other tweaks you made in there. Uh, yeah, some uh, better animation when falling into the dumpster. Um, and we changed, I think, one of the songs at the end. Um, but yeah, there's just a few things that ever since it originally came out that I was sad that I didn't take the time to do. And I thought when I had finished this uh, remastered version um, that I had included everything I wanted to. But there there are still things that I've thought of that I've forgot to put in. Um, but uh, overall, I think it's a pretty decent game. Oh yeah, the taxi. <laughs> Figuring out how to make the taxi work uh, was interesting. Just because in the DOS game, you actually type where you want to go. Yeah. Um, so luckily, there were only four places that you can... Well, I guess there are more places that you can drive to in the game, but you can at least get to them in the NES version by going left or right at a particular place. Uh, but fitting, fitting it to, to work with the controller, a lot of the things in this game is a fun challenge. Yeah. Uh, one, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I'm always conflicted about the death stuff in this game um, mm. because there's better animations in the DOS version of like the car actually coming out and hitting you. And I took a little bit of a shortcut by cutting straight to just telling you you died in text. I'm gonna ask you about a couple of those things that you cut or or because you just said you kind of wish you put in like the alley scene. Uh, was there a technical limitation or was it a time constraint that you ended up not putting that in? A mix between time constraint and just being... There were things that I thought essential to the game, um, and that wasn't really one of them, I guess, at the time. Um, I, I would have liked to have taken the time. That's one of the things I wish I would have done, honestly, but um, just when you're working on a project for so long, it gets to a point where you just want to be done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I got together with my friend Ian, uh, who did this, the chiptune music for this Call Me Maybe song. Um, and I was like, man, what's the most annoying song you can think of? And I guess this was the hit at the time, or maybe semi-recently before then. Um, but man, it was such an annoying song to us, so we thought it'd be funny to put it in this game. I'm, uh, I'm reminded of, uh, this is probably dating myself or you. Doesn't really seem like that, but if there's younger people, reminded of, uh, Wayne's World when he goes to the, uh, music shop and he starts to play, uh, Stairway to Heaven. The yeah. guy pokes over and he's like, point sign, no stairway. <laughs> 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 and that repeated, um... Ten, 10 years ago or so it was um a, an adele song i think it made oh, really? news at the time yeah I, I don't know if it was adele it was somebody <laughs> <laughs> i was always very happy with um adding sound effects that weren't in the original game yeah but when you knock on that door i thought it would be funny to do the da, 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 da. <laughs> Makes me laugh. 
and then the midget that I drew too small. <laughs> <laughs> he was not that small in the DOS game. And then learning the various spellings of whiskey. Like, there were very weird things that I learned while making this game. Yeah. Sometimes whiskey is spelled with E-Y, sometimes yeah. it's just Y. Different countries do it different ways. <laughs> so weird. How, how did you find the spots to insert um, your special twist or, or things into the game? Like, besides, you had to make some choices for uh, constraints or, or things like that, yeah. but you still found ways to kind of insert things here and there that were you. Yeah, I, I think that's sort of a almost selfish thing. Um, you want to you wanna honor the original game as much as you can because you love it and that's the reason you want more people to play it, but you're investing so much time in something and you can't help but want to put little little inside touches here and there yeah. that, uh, I don't know, show that it's personal to you. I think I looked up Al Lowe, who was the original uh, creator slash programmer uh, of the original Larry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I looked up his Twitter feed for all of these jokes. Because he writes jokes every day on Twitter. Okay. One dirty and one clean. And I think I just rummaged through those and found <laughs> jokes to throw in here. Um, and the password thing was... Uh, a choice because yeah. in the in the DOS game you type look around the bathroom or look on walls read walls something like that um, to to eventually get the password to get into the room where the pimp is in um, but without any sort of keyboard I just sort of threw the password on the wall and you physically walk and press A on it so a little bit easier uh, but I don't know some of the early puzzle game puzzles are a little bit obtuse one might say yeah figuring out what to type or even later with uh, yeah like a point and click with a combination yep what um, verb to use what noun to use so picky so speaking and this should just king's quest just pop up on the screen so yeah um king's quest has been and you've been teasing a little bit has King's Quest also been on your your list of projects that you wanted to bring to the NES for as long as you wanted to bring Larry to the NES? Uh, definitely not as long. Um, King's Quest was the first adventure game that I played, but I never owned it, so I didn't have the time investment um, that I had with Larry. So it was more of a... Um, it's kind of important to me because of it sort of shepherded my interest in, in what types of games I was wanting to play down the road. Um, but just, it's an important game, and I think that, uh, like Larry, a lot of people missed it. So being able to bring it over to the NES is something that I just want to do for game exposure, because there, I, I feel like there are certain games that console players missed, um, and, and maybe they don't understand... Um, in context, the importance of them. So, yeah. just another game on the list that I'd like to do. And the graphics are getting close on that one. Jordan's almost done. So, who knows how soon that might be coming out on the NES. <laughs> So this was not the earliest homebrew because there's been homebrews going way back before this, but this is still in the the origin of uh, NES homebrew. And there's a couple of things that were, I think, impressive for the time. One is this uh, the TV, that flashing uh, text. It's like a pulsating with um, not a constant rhythm. And the other one is going up here is going to be this censored with the scaling text. Was these um, things known at the time for developers to do that were discussed, or did you kind of figure these out at the time to uh, integrate them into the game? The scaling censored is honestly kind of a cop-out. Um, I drew the letters really tall and thin, um, so I just, I just switched one tile height mm -hmm. 
and sort of just made it. There, there's there's only like two sizes, so it's it's a little bit of a cop out. Um, so I, de I definitely don't think I reinvented the wheel um, here. I didn't come across anything amazing. Um, people have done, I'm sure, this kind of stuff all the time. But what was the other thing you mentioned? The TV, the pulsing TV, like the light illuminating from the TV. Yeah, I think that was just a, a simple increase the palette number mm. every frame. Um, and because a lot of the groupings of colors on the NES are similar when you get certain color ranges, it looks like it was on those colors longer than others just because mm. of the frames that that color looks like. So I think both things uh, that you mentioned I lucked into and probably aren't that impressive to a programmer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a lot more known now and people are doing a lot of uh, in the in the um, tech demo thing, it's really crazy things, but yeah. this was this was early on, so to me it's impressive. Thank you. This uh, this whole bar area was the, the first part that I was working on when I made the game, um, and this was actually, at this point I was doing the graphics myself, um, so this whole bar area I was doing the graphics on um, to try to do it all, but I quickly realized that I'm just not a not talented enough to do all the art in the game, and two like drawing it and programming it is just too much. So Bradley uh, Bateman came on board and took over after that um, and saved the day. Really, he did a hell of a job. Bradley's like that, uh, but, uh, running the Nestev uh, compo now. Yeah, that's that's right. He is. Uh, I was gonna say I like. I forgot that I did that with the license plate. That's funny. <laughs> well, um, after the gameplay, I'm going to pull up. I have some comparisons so we can kind of look at oh. uh, between the DOS release uh, and uh, the NES release. Okay. Lots of concessions for sure. <laughs> some of these jokes are so lame. It was also interesting coming up with the music um, because the original version really only had a couple songs in the game, very, very basic. So wanting to expand on that a little bit was, was fun. Gives the game some flavor. Oh man, the, the animation on the disco, uh, it's one of my favorite things in the game. I just love the way that looks, and the graphics are so big. Um, I, don't know each, I don't see a lot of things on the NES that look like that. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. So we're going to walk into the casino, and... Oh. What, what was the challenge? Was there a big challenge to kind of put in mini games into a game? Is that something that you had to tackle where you can put a game within a game, basically? Not super hard. I mean, you have to program sort of a new game engine for those parts of the game. Um, but overall, it was it was fun. I actually, at the time, was working at a, a, a travel job, and I would program a lot um, on the road while a buddy of mine was driving. So. I remember programming the the slot machine during during travel work hours, and I think I put roulette in because I didn't want to program blackjack. And I was gonna I put, ask, is it possible to play blackjack? The box no, is it's like... not. I, I put <laughs> I put the threshold one dollar more than you're able mm. to get in the game as a sort of a joke. Um, but doing roulette was a lot of fun <laughs> it seems to hit uh, like black 15 a lot it, it's weird there are certain n numbers that keep coming up man good memories <laughs>
Oh man, elevator screen. This was like the hardest thing in the world to program. And I'm sure for a lot of other programmers it wouldn't be that big of a deal, but the the perspective of walking behind the columns um, and the animation of the door opening, like I kept getting background flickering and it was just a pain in the ass to get working right. Those are, those are screens I'm very proud of. This pause or where it redraws actually helps this a lot because I had I watched playthroughs of the original Larry uh, for DOS and the screen transition is instantaneous and yeah it, the elevator climb is um, not as successful as I think this one is just because either the, re the pause and redrawing the screen or something it gives you a second to kind of understand what's happening yeah and I really like the fade in of each screen. Um, I think that just adds a touch of, I don't know, it just looks nice. I think this was the project that I learned how to do fade-ins, mm -hmm. um, incorporated it to sort of do it automatically. I think it like takes the palette value, subtracts 20 from it, and then checks if it's below zero. Um, but I just built it, I built it into the the game load state engine, and I've used that same code in every project ever since. <laughs> so every time you get into this taxi, it makes a joke. The tiny taxi. Yeah. Um, what's the story of, <laughs> about um, it? After I drew it, I realized it was just small. Like, it, it, it's the scale of the taxi should be bigger, but um, that would start introducing flickering if I made it wider, so that's as big as I could have made it, um, unless I made it background tiles, and there was palette stuff that I would have had to figure out, so um, <laughs> just sort of a, a joke to play off the fact that I didn't want to redraw it bigger. <laughs> and then figuring out I, I thought that this part of the game in the original was a little obtuse, so telling the player, you know, keep it up, I think uh, prompts them to know that you need to keep handing her things. Yeah. I probably should have made him move out of the way so the sprite overlap wasn't wrong at that point, but lazy and then the walking in place animation for dancing <laughs> I, th uh, I think it's good it's um not it's until okay. Okay. you watch the dos one and you're like oh the floor lights up that's yeah when you see the difference <laughs> yeah and like this the sprite animations of them dancing like i can't imagine how long that took al bailey and, and the original programmers like it's just insane i'm sure they had scripting languages to handle a lot of it but yeah so many sprite changes and scale changes and it goes on for an entire song I was like I'm not doing that <laughs> <laughs> oh this was the other song my buddy Ian did the get lucky song it's interesting having like modern touches in such an old game I guess it isn't modern to today's standards but at the time these were new songs I love that the guys are all still looking at the direction that she was sitting. So going back to the casino, gotta, gotta get to win money. the money. Yep. <laughs> um, so I think this goes on for a little bit. So. I'll kind of ask a question in here because I don't think I encountered it and I kept looking for it. So apparently there's a secret in the game and you can talk to Paul. I have no... Where, where is Paul? Oh, if You don't have to give that away, but... Uh... Oh, no, I don't mind. I'm sure at this point everyone who has wanted or knows who Paul is would have, would have found him by now, but I think it's the seventh floor of the hotel. 
Um, maybe the door on the top left or top right. One of those doors. But you can sell him the porno magazine to secretly get, I think, $100 or $200 or something. So oh. it saves you <laughs> It saves you one point of having to gamble in the game, because you have to gamble twice uh, to get $100. Yeah. Um, Uh, what what Ooh. made you uh, put him into the game? Besides uh, that, solving the issue. Well, he was at the time uh, we were hanging out in. I think at that time the Nintendo Age chat was like a tiny chat link. Um, so Paul, who went by P Surge uh, back in the early Nintendo Age days, and I think he changed his name to Paul. He hosted a couple uh, campouts in Tennessee that a lot of the collectors went to. Anyway, he was one of the main people who kept encouraging me to, to go back and finish this game because I would get sidetracked with another project or another hobby. Um, and he, he kept me sort of honest by, you know, how's Larry doing? You, you going to finish that damn game? So I wanted to sort of thank him in a, in a long-term, you know, memorial type of way and figured I'd put him in the game. Uh, coincidentally... Um, all the sprite art that I used for that scene was um, created, I think, for one of his campouts. Uh, mm. The guy who did some of the graphics for the early Battle Kid uh, game um, did a flyer for the Nintendo Age campout, and and I took his art from that flyer and put it into my game. So, kind of stole it, but I, I had his permission. He was he was a friend of mine. So it's just a fun, easy way to put something fun in. Yeah, you're doing pretty well. I think I started to lose it all. <laughs> yeah. Going back to the disco to uh, pick up the girl. And then we're going over to the chapel. Heck yeah. Some money. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> it did solve an issue for <laughs> right. instead you of having have to keep track of how much money you actually have. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I think in the DOS or the Apple, and you have to type in like, look at wallet. Okay, I got yeah. this money. And you have to be like, give this much money. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, the flasher. <laughs> yeah, right here is one of the few places that flickers in the game. Too many sprites. And I hide it all behind a text box. <laughs> and he gets so wordy at this point in the DOS game like I had to sort of consolidate the thoughts to a single window uh, at a time so that was interesting but I love I loved uh, putting this song in the game too <laughs> it's so so funny to me I think you had to do um, similar consolidation in the bar as well um, either yeah make some choices there to kind of get yeah, it down within sure. a reasonable uh, scale. <laughs> yeah, get the point across and fitting my very basic text window that never changes size. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love doing... I don't know, there aren't a lot of like three-dimensional games like this in mm -hmm. on the NES, so like seeing depth perception um, anytime I see that in a game I get really excited. Back to the casino. Gotta gotta pay <laughs> pay the chapel. Everyone, everyone's uh wanting their dang money. <laughs> Ooh, lucked out there. Dang, triple <laughs> bar on the first try. <laughs> That's awesome. It's gonna get wordy again. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> 
That's right. I did do that. <laughs> Whoops. Or we get rolling. Man, Brad did such a great job with this art. <laughs> Not a lot of pink stuff on the NES either. Looks no. Cool. I can't think of any actually. I was like, oh, Kid Icarus? No, there's no pink. <laughs> Maybe Barbie or yeah. you know, Mermaid? I don't know. Oh, Fawn. <laughs> so coy. I played this a, a few times, so uh, my little, um, well, it, for the, the viewers who've never seen this, I had my little revenge, <laughs> not leaving much in my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. Get her while you can. <laughs> Kappa Ray. <laughs> We'll go see Paul after we get robbed. Uh, yeah, you say you keep the magazine, right? Yeah, she just takes your money. I think I used the same door knocking audio cue on that door also. <laughs> Tried to make a generic rat beat for this screen. <laughs> I think I had to make a choice there also. I don't remember exactly how the commercial is read in the original game, but I tried to make it a little a little more obvious. Dang, you really are gonna... I think I leave like a dollar. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Even to hotels. Consider it done, and thank you much. <laughs> oh, she gets more than a dollar. She gets eight dollars. <laughs> This song always makes me really happy. <laughs> Such a mean joke. It was the delivery boy. Go get it, Larry. <laughs> Your time has come. I don't know if you noticed, um, the border of the text box and the border of like the screen lines 
is not a consistent color between all the screens. Oh, I did not notice that. It goes between like white and gray, depending on what colors I had to use. It was interesting going through this project. Um, actually, it probably predates this project when I would go back to, to play this game, because growing up, um, I only had the first disc of the game, so I would get to the taxi, uh, and I didn't have the manual either, so I wouldn't know the destination that you could type to go to. So I never got out of the bar area, so going back to play it as an adult, um, and actually seeing the rest of the game <laughs> was fun. So you'd be sneaking off uh, to play this um, the, the when you fall behind. <laughs> <laughs> the scandalous bar area that I never saw anything else of. I think in the original game, if you don't pick up the rope right there, mm -hmm. um, it's sort of a game-breaking yeah. feature where you can't get back in the room. Um, but I think in mine... You can go back in it. I don't remember. I feel like people were trying to get me to do that. I don't remember if I did or not. Um, I think you have to revert back to an old save. Oh, really? Yeah. So I didn't concede. Held to my <laughs> guns. <laughs> oh, you're not going to go see Paul? No, I, I did not know about that. I was like, where is Paul? <laughs> <laughs> So you need a couple bucks, because if you just leave with your um, mystery $10, you'll run out of money and game over. Yep. Talking about um, how you would keep replaying um, the beginning, and I was thinking back about um, how, I, I guess when you're younger, you'll just replay the same thing over and over again. And I only had the shareware version of Doom. And I think my I had a teacher, and he was really into Doom. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'll bring it in. And he, the next day, he's like, this is just the shareware version. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's the game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, back then there were just less things to play. You had what you had, so yeah, you would sit with these things for hours. Man, Doom was so fun, though. <laughs> I remember the early days of dialing into like a friend's modem to play <laughs> games like that. Just so it's so cool. All right, this time we will not die. <laughs> I always thought it was weird that you would die if you don't take off the condom if you leave the room. Oh, we get to see the animation again. I'm excited. Now oh, this was fun to draw. Anything not angled straight on the NES is very interesting to draw. Things on <laughs> angles are fun. <laughs> I love that he lands face down the second time. That was, I lucked into that because it just, it will adjust the, the sprites every X number of frames. And I think there's like a counter to show like if it's one, show these sprites, if it's zero, yeah. show these sprites. And I didn't reset the counter so it's doing the same code both times you fall, but the counter, when it starts on a different value, it ends up mm -hmm. being a different orientation when you're done. It's funny. All right, getting to the end game. <laughs> So when 
you get up to the top floor, before I, I saw the ending of um, the DOS release, like, the just disappears. I'm like, oh, maybe he didn't want to make her walk away. And then it's like something very similar <laughs> in the DOS yeah. game. <laughs> yeah, it ends very abruptly. <laughs> with fireworks. He did fireworks. I didn't want to put the effort into that. <laughs> I did the fade out like a movie. <laughs> no, I'm talking about uh, at this uh, counter scene when you're talking oh, to her. Oh, okay. I thought you meant the end end. Yeah, <laughs> no, no. yeah. <laughs> Just vanishes. <laughs> to her name. Will Larry ever find love? <laughs> and there's the purple the Ganon. Purple Ganon. <laughs> And this is something that you changed uh, with um, Engagement Edition, the text yep. there about NA. Yeah. So many memories and so much of my life I spent on that forum. And just to know that if the forum didn't exist, I would have never learned to program. Um, it's crazy to think about how a, a simple website will change your life. Should have taken the time to actually put the close up of the, the blow up doll in the game. It looks so ridiculous in the original. That's a so long baby. <laughs> I like the water animation too. I think that looks pretty cool. In the background art is so the buildings, it's such a unique style. It's um, how you finish this. This this was something the first time I played that was lost on me. I had to look it up. So I'm like, what do you do here? <laughs> uh oh. So she says, yeah. The the Eve. only hint is Eve. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, what 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 do you do? <laughs> Freshen that breath. funny to imagine something like this happening in real life like a girl just chilling on her roof a stranger walks in it's crazy you did a really good job of ending with a very low amount of money also three dollars <laughs> yeah you, you just got you got just enough both times it's awesome the slow fade out. <laughs> yeah, so this song is something we changed also. In the original I did a, just a slower... I don't know, I thought it tonally was something that I liked. But I wanted to... I don't know, I really like honoring the original as much as I can, so asking the Human Thomas to 
take the original theme and and redo it on the NES. Uh, I I love hearing it. So um, the scroll through of everyone who participated in the project, and there ended up being um quite a, a large amount of beta testers. Yeah, there, I mean, like I said, there was a lot of interest in the game. Um, and I, I really wanted to do this one right. Um, so I, it's funny, I, I think I like was taking applications. Like I wanted to make it official, so I'd take applications to be a beta tester. So I made this little sheet that people had to fill out and, and send to me. So I wound up picking these guys and they were a great team. Um, it's crazy. Uh, one of the beta testers was Callie, um, who was a huge uh, NES programmer at the time. Um, and just knowing that someone of that caliber was like testing something that I programmed, it was pretty intimidating. Um, but I was honored that he was even interested. So, super cool. You know, a special thank you to um, to uh, Rob Bryant and uh, to Brian Parker, which um, I think you, you've mentioned several times. Some people that you you really looked up to in in the early in your career, as far as uh, people in the scene. For sure. I mean, Rob, um, he was an inspiration. Like even before I knew how to program, like seeing what he was doing um, and knowing that, you know, in his day job, he was just a janitor. Here's this guy who um, is just going to work and coming home and like he's making these brilliant projects. And I was like, man, if this guy knows how to program, I bet I could do it. So he really inspired me to learn. Uh, and Brian, of course, from the start, you know, he, he wrote the Nerdy Nights uh, tutorials and he, he was always there to to answer my questions. And a lot of times I didn't even know how to ask the questions I was asking because just sort of an ignorance thing. Uh, but he was so patient. Um, he answered everything to the best he could. And I wouldn't have been able to do this uh, without those guys, for sure. Um. So now that you've kind of got a refresher, um, seen this playthrough, uh, how do you feel about the project overall looking back on it now? I mean, I, I couldn't be more proud. Um, it, it, there's so many sort of emotions looking at it, you know, the whole history of me wanting to make it and the sort of getting together all of these different people and, and asking questions and just going through the programming and the beta testing. Um, there's just so many memories. And honestly, it was one of the most special times in my whole homebrewing career. Um, I, when I was getting close to releasing this game um, while I was programming it, I just had this innate fear that something tragic was going to happen to me and I wasn't going to get to finish it. Um, because I really, there was something about it that I just thought was really important that I do. Like, I need to finish this game. Um, so I'm just relieved that it's done and people have played it and it was received well. Um, everything that I set out to do, that my reasons for doing it, I think paid off. Um, so I, I'm super proud of it and I'm honored that you would want to hang out and talk about it uh, for, you know, this time tonight. It's great. It's, uh, it's really nice to hear that. Um, it was such a special game for you to make that you can look back on it and be really proud of it. Yeah. And it sounded like it came at um, uh, a well-placed time in your life that this had an impact on you and, and was important. Yeah, I mean, it pushed me in a lot of ways to to grow as a programmer, um, as a game developer, um, just... I don't know, it's, it's hard to put into words, you know, it was just sort of a seminal project and, you know, I've made quite a few games since then, um, but I still think it's among uh, one of the most important games that I've done, both in how it was received and what I'm most proud of. Um, I, I love that I did it and I love that uh, it's gone over so well. Is, is that why, what made you come back to the project years later and then release um 
the engagement edition, which had some, it wasn't a remaster, but put in some extra things and gave an opportunity for more people to, um, to buy the game and play it. Throughout the years, the game grew in popularity. Like I just wanted the game to be done when I was working on it. Um, and I didn't really expect it to get as popular as it got. Um, so when people kept buying it and requesting it and, I don't know, they're, seeing it played um, by other people throughout the years, there were just certain things that I thought, you know, I wish I would have put this in the game. I wish I would have put that in the game. Just minor things that bothered me. So um, putting some extra things in that I always wanted to, plus putting some more copies out there um, for people who uh, never got a chance to buy it, you know, in its first iteration. Um, it served a couple purposes, but uh, I'm really happy that I I was able to take the time to to tweak it a little bit. It really had a it still had a a large crowd looking for it because you ended up having the two on the engagement edition. You had to do two um, blocks of of sales of it. Uh, yeah, and sold out quite fast both times. Yeah, and and even yeah even after the second time, people were still clamoring for it. Like it, it's just crazy. The the name recognition alone, I think, of Leisure Suit Larry, like people, when they hear it, it's on the NES, it sort of blows their mind. And I love that it sort of got to this level where people, they desperately wanted it enough to log on a website at a specific time in hopes that they can you know be one, one of the first ones to buy it. Um, I love it, man. I love that uh, it did this well. So um, besides... The, the two releases, the Engagement Edition and then the regular release in 2014. You also did a big box edition akin to like big box PCs. Um, what, why was that important to you or, or what made you kind of... And you did this for a while to do these big box editions. Um, so it came with uh, a red cartridge, uh, numbered, and it also came with um, a beer bottle uh, named after the... the um, the bar in the in there, I think, and it said it says Neo Delfino Brewing on it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, I think when I got to this game, a lot of people were offering limited edition type stuff for games they were putting out or reproduction reproductions they were putting out, and it just seemed like people were just cashing in on calling something limited, putting a number on it, and asking outrageous prices. So. I wanted to sort of hand create something that maybe felt a little bit more substantial. Um, who knows if I succeeded or not? I guess that's up to the uh, the consumer to decide. But um, I, I figured out a way to build something in a, in a bigger box. And when I was putting it together, um, Justin, who goes by Neo Delfino, uh, who is a home brewer uh, beer maker, um, offered to to do some. Uh, some brew, you know, some beer for the game to include with uh, the limited edition. So uh, it was something he just loves to do automatically, and he uh, volunteered to make those and send them my way. So it was cool that we got to offer um, a beer for each each version of the limited edition. And I, I don't know how legal it is to ship liquid um, across the country and world, um, but we rolled the dice and uh, didn't get busted. I, it must have been important to you because um, in our private conversations in the past, or, and I think you said this publicly, but you uh, you don't really have a habit of keeping a lot of your own releases or special editions. However, you kept the beer bottle. Uh, that's not true. Um, oh. I actually... I, I want to say one of the beer bottles that I shipped wound up getting destroyed. Mm. Um, on the way, so I wound up sending that person my personal uh, beer bottle. Um, but years later, um, actually last year, um, Kev bought, uh, who was one of the original people who had the limited edition, he got out of collecting, and he wound up shipping me his uh, beer bottle. So I have one again, but it is the one that uh, he had. Okay. Um, uh, I think that's the one I, I ended up with. Everything minus the beer bottle. 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, but it's I'm... cool to uh, it's cool to have it again because yeah, it's funny. You know, it's something that I didn't I didn't initially consider from the start, including, mm-hmm. but it wound up being such a unique item that yeah. uh, I'm glad that uh, I have one again. <laughs> it's it's cool. I'm, I'm happier you have it than I have it. I, I think it's more important for you to have it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, so let's, let's, uh, I guess step back a little bit and let's t- talk about, um, uh, laser shoot, laser shoot, la- <laughs> laser, <laughs> Larry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, if I recall correctly, you ended up, um, trying to get the blessing of Aldo. You reach out to him. Um, how, how did the exchange go or what was the takeaway from that? Um, so yeah, at the time I couldn't really... I couldn't figure out who had the rights to the game. Um, so I, I found Al Lowe's email address because um, he has a very active online presence. Um, he's very proud of the Leisure Suit Larry games that he uh, did and worked on uh, in his career. He hosts websites, um, answers questions. I actually sent him my, um, my original DOS box through the mail and he wound up signing it, sending it back. A uh, really, really nice guy. But I sent him uh, screenshots from the game uh, when I was getting ready to release it. Like, hey, you know, I just want to tell you what an important game this was to me growing up um, as a human being, as a video game lover, and now as a programmer. Like, I'm, I'm, I put a lot of effort into doing this because I want more people to uh, enjoy this game. So I just kind of want to let you know that I'm doing it, see what you think about it, uh, and if possible release it um you know if if we need to make some sort of deal where you get certain percentage of the sales i'm certainly open to that um and he wrote me back he was super nice uh said that the screenshots that i sent him actually brought back a lot of memories um but that at the end of the day he didn't own the rights so he turned me on to um i think code masters was the company at the time um and this was of course, years ago, and I think the rights have even changed hands a couple times since then. Um, but I wrote them emails, uh, essentially asking the same thing, you know, hey, I have this game, it's done, I'm ready to release it, you know, I, I would love to do it officially if we can come to some sort of agreement. Uh, and they essentially never wrote me back. So I took that as they don't care enough about either the project or I'm not going to sell enough copies to even worry about. Um, so I re- released it anyway. So again, probably teetering on the on the edge of uh, legality, but uh, I don't know. I wanted people to play the game, so yeah, I'd take chances in life. <laughs> uh, for the very least, of getting the uh, return letter from Allo with, um, I guess, praising your work and everything, that was worth it. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, and it's funny. Um, years later. Uh, I don't remember how it came up, but somehow he came across a, a version of my Leisure Suit Larry on Craigslist uh, in his area. Uh, and I guess he wound up like emailing the person selling it saying, hey, just so you know, this is not this is not an original version of Leisure Suit Larry. And I don't remember the details, but it was just cool knowing that like he he's actively looking, I guess, for Leisure Suit Larry stuff. And, yeah. you know, him knowing that he saw um, this version uh, out there existing. Who knows if he even put two, to two, two and two <laughs> together that it was the version that I showed him once upon a time. But uh, any story I hear about him knowing my game exists uh, is good enough for me. Um, let's take a look at um, some comparison shots uh, between uh, the 1987 um, EGA game and your 24 well actually this is not the 2014 this would be um the 2020 release okay so i got pulled up here this is between the two and we're at the title screen yep it's amazing what they did back in the day as far as animation like they really took a lot of time to animate things that maybe weren't substantial. Like, just the little touches on the title screen of him chasing the blow of doll, you know, with obviously an allusion to later in the game. Um, it's just cool. Like, the PC game right off the bat, you know it's going to be fun and quirky. I probably went a way more sexy sort of uh, direction, but 
the thought of a the silhouetted naked woman on the title screen of an NES game I thought was hilarious. So had to do it. <laughs> but it's also um, it's funny because I I wanted to create a logo, um, like a distinguishable logo for this game, which I think was the first uh, release that I did that for. So the oval Larry. Um, which I think I stole, you know, that style from like Seinfeld. It, it was very overused back in the day, um, but I took that from the box and sort of brought it onto the title screen. So it's cool seeing like a distinguishable logo, yeah, uh, for the project. So we're at the the factory scene now. Or yeah, the assembly. Yeah, yeah. So um, this one I actually did myself. You know, I I did this after, uh, you know, just a, a last year. Um, so at this point, Bradley was no longer working on the project, obviously, because it was done and it was years later. But um, I had to make some concessions as far as, you know, the right hand side of the screen. Well, the dimensions of, of the NES as a whole just aren't as wide uh, as a PC screen. So I had to sort of shrink things there. Um, but I think I did a good job of still getting the important things. And I think I was hoping to put multiple heads down there on the shelf kind of like they did on the PC version. Um, but same thing, like with the two characters, the King's Quest guy and the scientist down there, like it started running into sprite uh, flickering issues. So just sort of had to make some concessions. So here we are right outside the bar. Yeah, it's funny because I, I one of the early Nintendo Age members uh, name was Uncle Tusk, who was a, a good friend of mine. So changing the name of the bar uh, to Tuskies, I think was me trying, thinking, hey, maybe this is enough to avoid being copyrighted, you know, being sued for copyright infringement. So I changed the name of the bar. Um, still wanted to get the flickering O of hotel in there. Um, and with the taxi, you know, in the PC version, it animates on and off the screen. Um, I don't remember the details of why I didn't choose to go that route. Um, but uh, yeah, you can see that the, the taxi is obviously stationary in my version. I didn't do the light pole. That would have been cool to put in there. Maybe I ran out of sprite tiles or background tiles. <laughs> it's um, interesting. And as we go on to the, to the next one, it starts, it starts to be seen that you, I guess, had to make some creative decisions about perspective or things to cut off. And yeah, it's interesting to, to see that as it goes on when you see them in the side by side. <laughs> it's interesting because this is the first time I think I've seen a lot of these side by side. So this is interesting to me. Um, and I think the moose head was something that we added in the engagement version. I don't think that was there in the original. Mm. Um, but uh, the they did a new Larry game, I think in 2016 or 2017. Um, and they have this scene in it. Um, and the moose actually comes through the wall. Like, the rest of the moose is on the other side of the wall. Uh, it's just funny to think about now. But just it's just such a funny shape that I really wanted to put it... Uh, I wanted to get it in the NES version. That was one of the things that bothered me uh, from the original, not having put that in. Yeah. Um, but I would have also liked to put the fan in. The animated fan in the original is... It, it has a cool vibe. And I'm sad I couldn't fit that in there. So walking into the hallway in the back towards the bathroom now. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty close. I'm actually surprised how well I did. Um, I guess the perspective is a little different uh, on the NES version. Not quite as low. Um, and I guess the guy doesn't look super... Eh, he still looks pretty tiny in my version. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's cool seeing that side by side. Now into the bathroom. Pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you can see I I put Ken on there to make it obvious. Like, yeah. hey, go look at this. Maybe it's important. But yeah, that's actually... The mirror's a little bit small, but... Man, even the squiggles are kind of the same. I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> and when you enter into your game, uh, I believe the the ring sparkles in, in, yeah. the, in, the, in the sink. Yeah, because that's one of the things I never knew... And when I only had the first floppy disk, I don't think I ever got the ring. So I want to kind of make it a little bit more obvious that something's hiding down there. So we got the password and now we're 
uh, in the pimp's room. Yeah, it's a lot squattier in mine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I wish I could have added a lot of this detail of like the crummy walls and and the brick. Um, I guess I, I forgot that that's so distinctive on the PC version. Um, as as like a, as a player, you never see these side by sides, you know. Right. Just, you know, yeah. it's not as apparent, you know. <laughs> it's really cool. Actually, the angle of the stairs is pretty pretty close. I'm proud of that. That's nice. Now we're we're upstairs. Oh yeah, I don't have the railing on the stairs, and I moved the candy. Interesting. Color of the bed. Huh. That's so cool. I'm glad that you did this. This is really, really <laughs> neat. It, sometimes it's, um, as you see, you kind of see the things you did and didn't do, but then also it kind of might jog your memory of like, you know, why, why did you move that can to, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it was a perspective thing. Mm -hmm. um, since I was, since this was very early on in me programming the game, um, I, the the Larry sprites were at a specific memory range, mm -hmm. and putting other sprites in the game, I would have had to sort of rearrange where those sprites lived in memory as far as to show a different perspective. So I wanted him to always be in front of the candy, so that moving it up there was an easy way to do that because you can mm -hmm. never be higher than that point. We're outside in the in the it's alley really now. It's really close. <laughs> yeah, I'm missing a shadow and some foreground fencing, but yeah, it's it's not bad. I'm actually really proud seeing these side by side. The buildings on the edge of the screen look close. Huh. In the taxi now. Oh man, it's so much wider. It's nice. <laughs> Very yellow, funny. yellow is a hard color on the NES. There is yeah. there a lot of good yellows. Um, I almost started believing that this looked yellow, but now seeing it beside a real yellow, it's like so muted. <laughs> it's also depending on like, you know, um, what system you're playing on or what emulator you're playing on. There's a whole yeah. bunch of, not to get a deep dive into it, but uh, the NES palette, you know, how is it actually displayed? You know, that's. Yeah, yeah what's, wild. I think white is in the palette. No, oh, maybe white's not in the palette with the yellow. I'm just trying to w figure out why I didn't do the reflection on the trunk. Mm. I think it works well enough, though. Yeah. Oh, wow. We're outside you the quickie mark. lose everything in the window. I didn't even realize that. That's crazy. But yeah, the NES can only handle X number of tiles per background, so we had to make a lot of concessions about this. <laughs> um, that would have put us over the limit. Oh, man, that's crazy how much you can see through the PC version. Oh, and then we moved the, yeah. the phone. Probably because of perspective. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. We made a more distinguishable sign. But all the products behind them, man. It's crazy how much livelier, I guess I forgot how busy the PC version is. Yeah, but when you look back at like a lot of the NES releases of games that were on um, PC, oh, yeah. a lot they of were, these, these same they were things dumbed down. to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, this the for NES a lot isn't of good for... Complexity or, or colors. Yep. yep. <laughs> So cool. Okay. Just a little bit more zoomed in. Yeah. Outside the casino. <laughs> Those plants are nice. Yeah, you can you really... Got the, um... Go ahead. No, I was going to say, you got the sign really good. It really... It, and a static image doesn't come across, but you got the, the right. flashing of the sign to yeah. show very well. Brad did a very good job with that. And I think he even went so far as to, like, tell me which colors to to mm. animate to make it look best but it's funny you can you can really see here with the taxis side by side the the size difference <laughs> uh, hence the tiny taxi now we're in the inside of the casino yeah and this is this is really good you know, it's just missing some wall detail you know as far as the accents 
Right, and there were there's a lot livelier atmosphere. Like in the PC version, all these people mm-hmm. are here, and they're all sort of doing very basic animations, but they're they're moving to give mm-hmm. it some life. And that that's one of my regrets about my version is there's not a lot going on uh, animation wise on this screen. Oh wow, the slot big machine now. difference. <laughs> <laughs> huh so i just did away with the blue border looks like you, put a little you, you scaled it down there. a little bit but it's it's really good uh while you're playing the game the the animation of the slot machine yeah yeah that's cool you know, oh, wow like, that's way the different the elevator <laughs> huh it's things he, you don't you don't realize, you know, until yeah. you see them the side by side. Yeah, not at all. And I think on the PC version you can type like what floor am I on? Or there's some different mm. way to see what floor you're on, so I wanted to make it I needed to figure out a way to, to make it distinguishable what floor you're on, so adding the, the random number to the left there. <laughs> oh, and we moved the, the trash can again for perspective. Yep. You make it very clear in yours that there is something in the trash can. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I probably went too far. Like, I want to make the game easier because I want people to finish the games. Like, I want them yeah. to play through and experience it. But how much is too much hand holding, you know? How, how much is too much making things obvious? Maybe something sticking out of the trash can is a little too obvious, but. At the time, I thought it was a good idea. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, this is really close. Mm-hmm. A little bit wider. But man, all the perspectives are there. That's, that's yeah. nice. Oh, you I can even put... say you, you um, on your version, your uh, chair rails or the axe of them are... are better i think you know in the in this situation yeah i'm pretty sure this is a screen brad did he did a hell of a job i was just looking at the candles like i feel like i i had that would have taken a single sprite i could have added candles i'm bummed i didn't do that that would have been an easy an easy addition (laughs) but i never stopped to look at (laughs) and pay attention to the other one you kind of like look through like what's the most important the capture Like yeah. the feeling of the game when you're when you're when you're going through it, and in right. that way, it's it's very successful. Wow, he even got the last letter of the neighboring business. <laughs> That's really cool. He did a good job with the upper part of the disco sign too. The way it sort of angles upward. Yeah, um, stuff like that's really hard uh, with tile-based graphics. He did a really good job of giving it some. Uh, some dimension there. Now we're inside the disco. Oh, okay. We we couldn't angle one of the walls because of the dance floor. That's really interesting. The top of the PC version looks like Tron. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's close, though. Yeah. I mean, we're lo- missing some blues on the wall, but it's really nice. Outside the chapel now. Wow. Man, that's so good. He, he did so good, man. Got all the words on the signs. They match the style of the background buildings. Like, it's just so nice. <laughs> yeah, it's like um, inserting details in there, you know, could have easily cut out the background of the city. You know, yeah. I don't think anyone would have faulted, faulted you for that, but it, it's nice that it, it made its way into it. Yeah, it adds a little bit of ambience, I think. Now we're inside the chapel. I wonder why we used purple instead of... Oh, maybe because of the red and the heart. We wanted to distinguish it. Mm. That's pretty close, though. I, yeah. I, it's funny. The I don't think the sprites look too much worse on the NES. They're, they're chunkier, but I think overall it mm-hmm. gives you the same feel. Yeah. In the hotel room now. That's great. <laughs> Missed some of the outside detail, but 
the angles of the like banners on the ceiling looks really good i uh broke my rule here about one one uh image per per scene i had to uh had to include okay. uh <laughs> that's really close man the more i see these side by side the prouder i get of the project like it's amazing <laughs> how close it is yeah i love the expression on his face just the <laughs> the big old open black pixel area it's great mm. oh wow now we're at the top I, I forgot there were other doors on the pc version mm. yeah B big concessions here <laughs> had to redesign a little bit oh and you lose the top of the elevator interesting i think it works great though i'm yeah super happy with it and we had to put a button on the wall because you you can't i guess we could have just let you hit a on the counter but that's just so i don't know putting a button there i think works well yeah i think you this is one of the things you did to kind of inform the player a little bit because if you go up to the top floor um before you have the pills and you go to the button she says to you from the counter, she's like, don't touch that, or you're not allowed to touch that. So right. that kind of informs you, like, oh, this button's important, and I have right. to come back to it later. Nice. I will take that as a win. <laughs> All right, and now we're in the um, suite, um, in the Man, outside room. <laughs> he did such a good job with the... The muted colors where it's screened or where the, the window tint is. Yeah. That's so good. And yeah, we, we must have ran out of tiles for the art. So I used sprites for the Purple Ganon area. Because that was the big, the big joke on Nintendo Age at the time was Purple Ganon. So secretly throwing it randomly in this game was a, <laughs> it was a choice. But I think it's hilarious. It looks great, man. I'm so proud. Now we're in the back room. Yep. Very, very close. Just losing some color, but man, yeah. overall, so good. The zebra bit looks great. Even the folds, the wrinkles in the folds were the same. Yeah. That's, man, I'm going to send that guy another message, tell him how. <laughs> How thankful I am. And you even got the angle of the the blow up doll the same. That's pretty close. I think I drew the sprites. Um that's cool to see side by side. Huh. Now we're we're outside uh the hot tub. Again, background buildings look perfect. The outline of the bushes in the bottom, I think, looks great on the NES. Yeah. I don't think you even need that little brick foundation. Gives it a cool little, cool little ripple down there. Man, so good. The moon. Thank you for letting me see all these side by side. It's great. Problem. It was great to kind of um, get your your thoughts on it. You know, looking at the both of them side by side. I don't know. I've just gone for so many years thinking like we had to cut this and we had to cut mm -hmm. that, and we did the best we could. But almost downplaying it too much, like seeing them side by side every screen. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm very proud. He did such a great job. Well, um, stepping away from from the project for for a moment to talk about uh, other things in that you've worked on in your development, um, and we we kind of touched upon it for a minute before, but um, charitable causes seem to be important to you. You worked on uh, Shmup Speed with uh, Douglas Glover, and those benef that benefited uh, Extra Life. In addition, you've been supporting. Um, the Autism Research Project for years now with a, with a yearly NES marathon. 
do you want to, to talk about any of those any of those projects? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, for many years, uh, first a guy named Phil and then a guy named Ted took over uh, something called uh, the NES-a-thon, where they would uh, play games every year to raise money for uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, and I got the the honor of being part of that for a few years. Um, and it was raising money for an important cause. Um, and, and knowing that, man, like, we could make some sort of difference um, just by doing something that we already love to do. Like, who wouldn't want to sit around and play NES games for an entire weekend? Um, so I knew I wanted to take that idea and... Um, and do something with it. Um, I have a lot of friends who have children um, with autism, you know, they're on the spectrum. And I think a lot of uh, things having to do with autism are, are maybe misunderstood. Um, so I don't know, I really want to, uh, being able to do this, the spectrum marathon to raise money, you know, we, we just sit around and play games, which we would do anyway, you know, any excuse to hang out with friends and play games is great. But if, if we can do at the same time raise money for such an important cause, um, why wouldn't we do it? So yeah, we've been doing it. This will be the fourth year. Uh, we're going to do it here in a couple weeks, um, September seventeenth through nineteenth. But um, tune in and donate because these are important causes. I mean, if, if we can do the research to to figure things out um, to help uh, people on the spectrum live healthier lives or be better understood in the in the general public um it's a great cause so funding research for that helping fund is uh is important and a great way to uh i don't know to celebrate games and uh friendship that's uh that's good to hear and um yeah anyone that should tune in um a lot of people from the homebrew scene or or from Nintendo Age or video game stage, we we tune in. Um, we also make a you also make a, a I don't know if you or the people who who usually tune in, we make a point to um, to showcase some homebrew games in there. Besides all the the NES games that that people want to see. Yeah, and I think that's another special thing uh, with that dif- differentiates my marathon from the NESathon and and other. Um, game charity uh marathons you know we being part of the nes homebrew community and having a lot of my friends um who also do this and they they donate prizes and being able to showcase uh some of these amazing achievements that uh, other people were able to to produce on the system um it's just win-win all around we get to play awesome games with awesome people for an awesome reason um so yeah tune in twitch.tv slash NES Spectrum Marathon, I believe. Hopefully that's the right address. <laughs> <laughs> I'll include it in um, in the description. Um, hopefully this, this episode will air before <laughs> the... Yeah, the sorry NES to above. put you on the uh, <laughs> light of fire under you. Um, so, back to Larry. Is there any possibility of a future Larry game from you? Maybe um, not a port, but maybe your own your own take on the series, or or is are you leaving it at um, the Larry you just saw? There's so many thoughts um, that I've gone through in relation to this question uh, ever since I released the first Larry. Um, I played through the original Larry two um, a couple times just to kind of see. If a game, if that game were possible to port, you know, adventure games on the PC were growing exponentially around this point, and they were getting longer and more detailed and more animated. Um, so the the Larry Two original game, they used slightly more detailed graphics, uh, but not out of the realm of possibility. But the game itself is very long as far as the different locations and things. So. I think the original Larry 2 is probably too complex uh, to port to the NES. Um, But at the same time, I didn't want to be done with the series. Like, what other options would I have to to continue Larry on the NES? So 
I thought at first about doing a Larry to from Eve's perspective, who is the original, you know, the girl at the end of the the first game that I ported. Um, where what was she doing through this whole process of Larry winding up on the roof? Um, so thinking of uh, doing a game from her perspective and introducing different puzzles and a lot of the same settings, um, the thought of that intrigued me. But I I couldn't really I couldn't really formulate a, a good plot to to go with that idea too far. So then I wrote um, a pretty elaborate storyline, an original story of uh, of if I were to take what happened in this game and move forward with you know my own ideas. Uh, so I wrote a, a script, fleshed out a game idea for that idea, um, and went so far as to actually commission an artist to do some work um, to try to get that game off the ground. Um, and it, it stalled decently quick, um, just finding a reliable artist who was able to uh, to put forth the time uh, it just didn't pan out at that time in my life and and it might be something I return to down the road. Um, there's a couple other games that I want to maybe take care of more, but I would love to return to this whole world um, and come out with with a new game. Um, I think the story that I wrote is is good. Um, it's not quite as body or um, you know, naughty. It's it's probably more on the uh, the sensitive and and lovey dovey side. Um, but I thought it was a, un- a unique idea. So hopefully one day I'll be able to put it out. I can see that working coming off of this game because e- even though, and I think this even gets into at the time of the release in 1987 from um, Sierra's version of the game, a lot of people thought or not condemned it but some people were not carrying on the shelf and that quickly changed around as as opinion got out there it wasn't really i mean this is my own thoughts but um it's not really someone looking for a one night stand or trying to there's i think a little bit more there to it and it's interesting to hear that your sequel could be going into that a little bit more of what's behind larry Right, because pretty quickly in the official timeline, I feel like Larry as a character, his heart is always kind of in the right place, um, mm-hmm. but his execution isn't great uh, for one reason or another. Um, but, you know, after the original Larry, things were still very up in the air, uh, air about the type of person he is and you know where his morals lie, so... He really was looking for love um, and to sort of explore what he could have been if he was a little less, um, you know, here I am, ladies, and more like, okay, I found the love of my life. Can I tell a backstory of, you know, maybe Eve as a younger girl and her time at, in high school and I don't know, there's, there's this whole world that we can explore um, that I'd be curious to dig into at some point. But um, I don't know, the thoughts of what could have been, and I, and I love a lot of the later games, so don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to change the world of Larry because I'm unhappy with it in any way. Um, there's just always the, the curiosity side of alternate timelines of how things could have been. That stuff interests me. Yeah. Is your, your love of adventure games, is that what pushed you to kind of... Um work on well king's quest is in the works but your own game with um not exactly in the same strict genre but nescape or any escape where you kind of brought in that point and click kind of adventure bringing more of the games that you liked to to the nes yeah it's interesting because a lot of a lot of people that are into the nes are into a lot of the traditional platformer run and gun type games that you know there's a lot more action um and a lot of sort of instant gratification of shooting things i've always gravitated toward more slower puzzle based games um so spending a lot of my early years on adventure games like king's quest and larry and monkey island and space quest 5 um i don't know like i puzzle games always sort of just held like a special place for me, Um, figuring them out, sitting down with them. Um, 
you know, you could you could spend hours trying to figure out a single thing, but the feeling that you get when you figure it out um, at the end, I think, is unmatched in other game genres for me. So being that weird home brewer who focuses on puzzle games, I don't know. I don't I don't think there are a lot of other home brewers working on games like this. So being able to take early game types and and sort of molding them to modern genres like escape rooms. Um, bringing something like that to the NES was fun, and yeah, there are certainly a lot more point-and-click style games that I um, am either in the middle of making for the NES or are on my radar of things I'd want to do because, um, I don't know, I, I think it's 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 an interesting divide because on the early PC gamer side of things, everyone's into adventure games, and on the NES side of things, there aren't a ton of people that are into these types of games, so sort of br- introducing a, a different subset of gamers into uh, yeah. all of these games is, is a fun experience. We got a, a glimpse of that with uh, your recently, uh, you and Bo, with the assembly line with uh, Beyond the Pins. Um, we yeah. got a, a glimpse into w- what could be in store, you know, <laughs> with these modern uh, genre blendings. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. Um Especially with that game, you know, we took it to a whole new perspective and almost gameplay style. Um, we simplified a lot of things, but it, it allowed us to be more uh, detailed in graphics and things like that. So there are a lot of different ways that you can pull off these types of games. And um, doing that game in such a short amount of time, uh, it was fun because Bo was never exposed to these types of games growing up. So he, I think he, goes around saying that Larry, you know, that this game is the only point and click he's ever played, even though on the NES it's not even really a point and click. Um, so when he brought the the idea of doing a point and click uh, to that game jam, you know, it, it was his idea. So it was really interesting uh, <laughs> hearing that it was from him and uh, working on that type of game with him. Um, and uh, yeah, we're hoping to uh, maybe in the future expand on that idea a little bit. <laughs> He got the itch for more point and click, but will only play them on the NES. So he needs to make them with you. <laughs> yep, that's both for you. Um, so is there anything else you want to touch upon, uh, Larry, or, or your current work before we kind of uh, close it out? No, um, I just want to thank everyone who is interested in Larry either back in the day or you're stumbling upon it now, you know, finding out that it existed. Um, it's a super important game to me uh, growing up, you know, playing it and, and being able to take it and introduce more people to it. Um, it's an awesome feeling, and I'm just thrilled that I was able to, uh, to pull it off in the end uh, and that it was received so well. There would be nothing worse than like taking a game that's super important to you and then screwing it up. <laughs> um, but thank you for asking me to do this. Um, seeing all these, you know, taking the time to make all these side by side comparisons uh, was really a treat. Um, so hopefully we can do this again with a future Larry game. Oh yeah, I, I look forward to that. And uh, <laughs> well, thanks, thanks, Kevin, for for putting in you know, scheduling the time with me and, and sitting down with me to discuss this. I was looking forward to it and I was happy with uh, some of your comments that you're coming in talking about behind the scenes and, you know, uh, hopefully we can do this again. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who tested the game and everyone that pushed me to finish the game uh, and everyone that wound up enjoying the game. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being <laughs> interested. All right, and that, that closes. And uh, for everyone else out there, tune in for the next episode of Home Reason Focus, where we'll be meeting with uh, for another project and, and another developer. Awesome. <laughs>